that baptism. I was baptism, that, baptizing that day. <clears throat> but uh, Pastor Brooks said he just needed to do one. And it was for, you know. And so, let me tell you. You know, I, I guess, you know, you're thinking about days gone by and you're thinking about, you know, people have, who passed away and we're going we're gonna to be all together one day. So that's awesome. And nobody holds it in the hospital. Yes. I talked to her daughter. Yeah. <coughs> where is that? Where in hospice? Um, she kept sending me her address at home, though, I think. I want to know. It's in cars. Huh? It's in cars. Oh, good. Uh, I don't know if you just saw her phone now. Okay. All right. A day of worship. You know that. Okay. 
Mm -hmm. uh, baptism service today. If you haven't gotten baptized, let me know. I'll take you down there. Um, refresh happening from 6 to 6.30 in Heritage Hall, November 7th. Veterans Luncheon, November 10th. That's what, uh, Saturday? And they always have that every year. Um, Operation Christmas Child is going on. And bring your pack boxes back. And then first class is November 11th. It's usually the first Sunday, but now it's the second Sunday. And then it's going to be back um, again on the first Sunday. Baptism is going to start now after uh, today. They're going to have in two weeks baptism. And then from then on, it's going to be every second Sunday of the month. No more first Sunday. What? That's easy for you to say. That's hard to say that. Okay. And uh, that's because I, I was reading a text message. I have one son still staying at home, so he's in college too. Okay, let's see. Um, First Family Christmas tickets on sale, men's breakfast, Lakeside Grill, November 13th. Those are fun. 6.30 to 8, that's not so fun. But anyway, that's before you go to work. And they have a good hot breakfast and everything. They serve bacon, but it's a Baptist church. Okay. <laughs> then, let's see. Um, no Wednesday night activities, November 21st because of Thanksgiving. All right. And then... <laughs> No Wednesday night activities. Okay. Church office is closed November 21st through 23rd, so the rapture did not take place. It probably, but um, the church is closed. And that's about it. Who was at the uh, Sheila Walsh thing? How was it? Oh, man, that was heartbreak. I mean, it tell was us, good, but tell, it was... Tell us about it. And you're going to give a little... Uh, oh, so, so come up here. Oh, come up here. Cool. Oh, by the way, this is Lisa, Lisa Ramsey. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 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 Uh, she was, it was very hard, hard, hard touching. Um, Keep you on there. Mm -hmm. She um, spoke to us about what happened when she was growing up, and she said that her dad had um, had some kind of cer cerebral hemorrhage and lost his speech in part his, from sides of his um, body. And said how she, um, how he would got started getting angry and would hit her when she was young and they still live in Scotland. And she would do that sometimes. And then she said that one the last time she remembered the situation happening, her dog was rearing up and her dad was coming after her with a cane to hit her. And so um, locked the children up, locked them up, her mom did, and then he was beating her. So it took like six or seven, five people, five men to get him out of that. Um, she was telling us how, <clears throat> how um, shame, how we, should, we need to ask God into our past, how we need to ask, ask God to take care of our shame, get rid of our shame, not to just stay and live in our shame. And, um, and she talked about how she, when she was a CBN, she ended up having a mental um, breakdown, um, and she ended up going to a Christian-based hospital. She's there for a month, and she said that she ended up having PTSD because it went on with her dad and had severe depression. So now she's, her life is back where it needs to now. But she basically, the basic thing was, you know, shame, and, and you can't let it ruin your life. You can't let it go into every bit of your life, but you have to ask God and invite him to take care of your, your past because he already knows it. There's nothing you can do that can change God's love for you. It's, it's in there, but it's not something that God can't take away and forgive. I mean, it helps you to forgive others. It's not something that's unforgivable. It's what we think is worse than what, what God is. And how we need to know more who God is, and that goes with you know, really truly taking His word in and truly believing that He loves us, and not taking the world's view of what God's love is, but what God's version of love is through His word. That's basically it. But on the prayer report I have, for those who know I've been going through a couple of years of hard times and stuff, um, and the devil has really been working to get me discouraged in a lot of things. But um, <clears throat> my time is up at the sea refuge for the shelter, but one of the ladies in my classroom next door, Nancy Sitch, I think is how
how you say her last name? Anyway, she just recently had surgery and she has a broken leg. She has a condominium that she wants somebody to stay with her. So we'll stay with her, rent free. Praise God. Tell her what she needs to help Chris while she's going through that. Then in January, City Refuge is having a CNA class that I'll be taking then. So we'll be God bless you too. God bless you. I didn't report. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
produce these triggers besides the new triggers? Have. They do have. Yeah. Well, you have half century. I guess I can give a personal yeah. testimony. You know, my triglycerides are kind of high. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to cut down on sugar. So it's carbohydrates and, and, and processed sugars, cut out the coffee creamer or reduce the coffee creamer. Yeah, that's pretty much one of my major things. Sweets. Usually yeah. people want to do outward things. Right, yeah, outward change. Or outward internally. Well, I decided to take an opportunity to warn everybody about the dangers of sugar. We're learning more and more how bad sugar really is for us. And it's in everything. And it's in everything. If you look at the label on just about everything, you'll see sugar or high fructose corn syrup or all these sugars, and in, in our body really wasn't designed to handle all of that, so we wind up um, on, our, on a road to diabetes and obesity and all these things and um, coronary artery disease is another thing. That, uh, excess sugar can lead to tri higher triglycerides, causes inflammation in our body. Which you know, so, uh, the bottom line is, if you're eating a lot of sweets, consider cutting back a little bit. And you know, even in restaurants, in restaurants, you know, you get a, a potato. Don't even put sugar in the potato. Just yeah. take yeah. it. And it's full of sugar anyway. Right, yeah. Everything, you know, Chinese food, you know, you got all that salt they put in it. And, and things that you wouldn't even think they would put sugar in, they put in it every single thing right. you eat, practically. We just went through Halloween and all the candy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which one came with you? This one. This one. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's what I do. Stay well hydrated. I went from 85 to 185. 285? Right, exactly. And I've got a family history of heart attacks, so I've got to have a, 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 a special uh, uh, concern here. All right, let's see. Let's review a little bit. We're in the letter of James. Um, and James in the Greek is Yaakovash, or in Hebrew, his name was Yaakov, right? And uh, actually, most of the ancient translations um, rendered his name as Jacob. Um, there's several Jacobs for James in the Bible, right? Yeah. But this is the one we're talking about today, was the, he's actually the half brother of Jesus. You know, the King James Version, his name is strangely translated. <laughs> anyway, so James was the second born of, of uh, the brother of Jesus, right? He's also a carpenter. And uh, he didn't believe his brother until later. Um, the fact that none of Jesus' brothers recognized his lordship uh, when they were growing up, um, none of them did. Uh, let's see, James rose to prominence as a leader of the Messianic Mother Church in Jerusalem, which was composed mainly of Jewish Christians. Uh, he was one of three pillars of the church, the other two being John and Peter, stated by Paul, I believe. And we know uh, he was martyred around AD 62, charged with breaking the law, and he was stoned to death by an angry mob. You know, you know, when I think about that, I just, Think about how legalism can do that to your spirit. Make you just angry and hateful. And so the letter uh, was a summary of James' wisdom and was written to all the fellow, outside, uh, fellow outsider of the followers outside of Jerusalem. Sorry. Uh, it's actually been referred to by scholars as the New Testament book of wisdom. And some of the Old Testament ones were Job, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs and some Psalms. It was written in the 40s uh, and is considered by scholars to be the very first epistle of the New Testament, followed by Galatians. 
Um, he was the first model pastor of the first church. He stayed home in Jerusalem leading the first church for more than 30 years until he was killed. Uh, some things we know about James, he was a man of humility. He starts off his letter as being a bond servant of God, his older brother. Right? Started off his life not believing him. Grew up with them, and then all of a sudden, he's now calling to his Lord and Savior, being a servant to him. Uh, he was a righteous man. He was known as James the Just. Uh, he was a loving pastor, a man of the word and of prayer. And he was a theologian. Christ was the source of wisdom. So, but our lesson today, we're starting um, about faith and works. So, let's see. We're in James chapter 2. Starting with verse 14, through, uh, through to the end of the chapter. So he says, uh, what, is, what use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? He's talking about being saved by works here. No, we're saved by faith in Christ, not of works. But genuine faith goes beyond the words that come out of our mouths. Uh, so we're, are we comparing faith and works in this chapter? No. James is teaching us about dead faith versus living faith. So uh, in Hebrews uh, eleven six it says, But without faith it's impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So there is no such thing as living faith that doesn't produce works. Living faith always produces works. Our living faith is more than just believing. So when he says, can that faith, meaning dead faith, save him? What do you think? The class says, no. But works are evidence of our salvation. So in Isaiah 29, 13, Therefore the Lord said, in as, in as much as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed, me, uh, removed their hearts far from me. <coughs> That's dead faith. Um, in Matthew 5, we go through a bunch of verses here. Uh, 16, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And then in Hebrews 10, verse uh, 24, uh, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. And then Titus 3, 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable uh, to men. And uh, Luke, going through a lot of stuff here. Luke 6, 43, uh, Jesus tells us that every tree is known by its own fruit. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. So, what is a core attribute that marks genuine faith in Jesus? Works. Love? God. An attribute. An attribute. What is a, what is a core attribute? Well, fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, and self control. So Jesus, Jesus gave us this new commandment to love one another as he loved us, right? Uh -huh. And by that love, the world would know us as his. But non-believers love each other, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just love for those who love you, Jesus said. Uh, even the Gentiles do that, right? So in Matthew 5, Jesus goes a little bit further here. He says uh, in verse 44, He said, you've heard it, well, 43. He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. 
But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. So, um, so we're demonstrating love for everyone, even our enemies, right? So Jesus called us to love. What would the devil want us to do? He'd want us to hate, to destroy. So the thief comes to destroy and kill. So, So, um, what is one of the primary tools the devil uses to promote hate? Kind of, um, he, he can use gossip and slander to spread hate, right? It's amazing how much damage gossip can do to the people who hear it. Uh, think about it. If it tempts you to hate, you know, Pastor Cook was saying at the men's breakfast, he said uh, that we shouldn't talk about each other, we should instead talk to each other. If we're supposed to love and restore with a spirit of gentleness, we can better do that by talking to others rather than about them. So we can identify ourselves to the world by our brotherly love towards each other, but also loving of enemies further sets us apart from the world, right? So we're not hating, we're not bashing others, we're not throwing others under the bus, we're not condemning others, we're, being, we're not being hateful, but rather we're loving and compassionate towards everyone, even the people that cut us off the track. <laughs> and this was a really foreign idea to the Greeks. The Greeks usually thought, or at least when you're going back to Plato, they always said, what is justice? And justice, as defined in the Republic by Plato, is to do good to your friends mm -hmm. and to refute your enemies. This is, and this is 180 degrees opposite from Greek philosophy. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the Greeks, I'm sure it was very difficult to accept. Well, it seems like it was also part of the law. Yeah. Right. So remember, there's no better opportunity to act like our Heavenly Father than when we extend grace to others, right? He extended grace to us, and we can then in time extend grace to others. Go ahead. Um. He, he almost had a crusade that to say that we should speak to other people. I, I think it takes a whole lot to speak to other people. It, it, it's so much easier to say that done because it takes two parts, wouldn't it? The person needs to be, we, you know, we on the other end, we need to always tell ourselves that when people speak to us, we need to listen instead of putting up a wall to be said. I just found it very difficult. I always try to do that. That's why my family have a hard time with me. They still love me, but. You have, have a hard time speaking to others? No, when you tell people, when, when you tell people, you know them, in your opinion, mm -hmm. that they are not correct. Of course, they think they are correct. Of course, otherwise they wouldn't do right. things that they choose to do. Then when you correct them, when you tell them my opinion. I think it's very hard to do that. I still do it, that's why I don't have too many friends, but you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying that it, it, it's easier to say than done. I just don't find any easy solution. Yeah. Of course, I still tell me too. I have to tell my daddy too. Okay, I changed. Like my teacher said that I can't cook, and they laugh at me. I said, okay. I'm open for suggestions. I, my cooking has been improved. I'm bringing chicken now, me for the <laughs> for Thanksgiving. Okay. Ah, but that used to be the weekend. Yeah. It That's kind great of for me. Hurts me this morning. But, you know, we're talking to people and we're getting to know them and we're seeing things that, uh, like you said, they're doing something the wrong way or they're saying there's some something in their life that's really destructive, whatever that might be. Um, I, I can speak from personal experience on this is that there are, there are a lot of excuses that I've created or that we've created to support this action that we're doing. And so it occurred to me this morning that if you can kind of identify those excuses and start to take them apart, so take them apart and just diffuse the excuse. You can imagine each excuse is like a nail in the coffin. Lid. And so as soon as you can get that nail pried out, and just do it, start working on one at a time, 
um, then you're you're attacking the excuse that. Uh, attacking each excuse rather than addressing the main problem, right? So you can start dismantling or diffusing, diffusing all these little excuses. Maybe that would be one possible route to take. It takes uh, some thought and some discernment to try to figure out you know, what, what possible reasons might this person have, have to justify the behavior or whatever it is. We'll just try to look at those and take those apart anyway. Let's get back to um, James uh, in verse 15. If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, and yet do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? So imagine something. Imagine you're, like someone's broken down on the side of the road, and you stop in the winter time. And you say, hi, hope your car gets better. Have a nice day. And then drive on. Well, that would be uh, something like that. Yeah. Obviously, James disapproves of all this uh, talk and no action kind of faith that he was seeing in the time. And talk is cheap, but actions speak louder than words. The faith motivates a believer to see a need and do something about it. Going on to verse 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. So James is summarizing here that faith without works is dead faith. It's by itself. Uh, it's, so, it's important to see the difference between Paul's teaching in Galatians that the law could not save and James' teaching that empty faith cannot save. The two are not in disagreement, but are examining saving faith from two different perspectives. Uh, one is in faith with works, and the other is in faith with no love in their hearts. So a question, what, what evidence might the person point to as proof that his or her faith is alive? They're doing something. neighbor as you would have yourself treated. And it's funny that James has that same line in uh, chapter 2 in an earlier verse I think it's 8, 2, 8 mm -hmm. he states, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And in Galatians 5, 14, same thing. Mm -hmm. Even though they differ, Paul and James a little, they have that same exact um, verse in 5, 14 Galatians and 8, uh, two, uh, eight here. Yeah, both so, from the law. Yeah, right, and they really are on the same page, right. but it's just you're right there arguing works and law. I think a little differently, but uh, but they, they are on the same page. So is that commandment invalid because it's part of the law? Um, like which one? Love? Which one? I mean, we're not under the law anymore, so is that commandment no longer valid? Oh, it's still it's still valid, definitely, but. Obeying that law will not get you grace or will not get you uh, faith or right. will not save you, but you're still responsible. I think Paul and the apostles have completely restated that law, that, that directive, so uh, it's still a valid. <coughs> yeah. and, it, and it's a moral law. Right. You know, and that has never changed. Mm -hmm. People nowadays say, well, the law's been done away with. Well, Really go out and murder somebody. Right. You know? <laughs> also, over here, even so, you know, um, I'm 17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead. And some people stop there. Like, there's some denominations out there that say, no, if you don't, like, believing in Jesus is not enough. Mm -hmm. You have to do something because if you don't, it's just dead, that means you're not saved. What do you say to that? What if you're dead? Yeah, you can't do anything. What if you're the thief on the cross 
and they have their hands tied. But I've, I'm on a discussion with some um, Catholics that say, no, you, you Protestants believe that all you have to do is believe by faith in Jesus Christ. But if you don't do something like get saved or take the Eucharist and um, do, oh, right. yeah, then you're not you're not saved. But you, you have to continuously affirm your salvation by works, and if you stop doing that, you're not saved. And so what you tell them is, you know, um, faith without works is what dead. dead. But does that mean you lose your salvation? No, it could mean you could lose your rewards. But not your salvation. We're going to see we've got an interesting way to explain. So it, by itself, the faith is just by itself. It, okay, so let's go on. Verse 18. Uh, but someone may say, uh, well, say, you have faith and I have works. And then James said, well, show me your faith without works and I'll show you my faith by my works. So what James was uh, talking about, this hypothetical someone uh, who boasts their good works as proof of their strong faith, um, is one possibility. Uh, this is the prideful one who does everything just to impress others. There's no motive uh, than what they can get out of their works. The recognition, the notoriety, uh, notoriety these are like selfish works. Jesus taught it in Luke 18 about this. In the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, right? You all heard that? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Luke 18, 9. Did I say? So uh, also he spoke this parable uh, to some who trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others. He said, two men went up to the temple to pray, one Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. The tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his chest and breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And it, he who humbles himself will be exalted. You know, a lot of people say to me, because, you know, do you really need to go through a sinner's prayer? They say, uh, you know, but the Bible does say as many as received him, and then he gave the right to be called children of God. You know, it's, it's doing something. And it's expressing faith in our hearts. And over here, Jesus is saying, well, there was a tax collector who said, you know, oh, God, please forgive me. I'm a sinner. It sounds like a sinner's prayer to me, you know? So oh, anyway. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Yeah. The thief on the cross, didn't he pretty much say the plan of salvation? He believed in who Jesus was. He said, yeah. Yeah. Remember me when you come into your kingdom, uh, King. You know. He was saying pretty much the same. Yeah. So this hypothetical someone, if you think about the context of the time also, James was his uh, audience was mostly converted Jews. Uh, he could also be the person that's rejecting the gospel of faith, salvation through faith. Could have been a Jew who's still holding on to the law for salvation, and they're boasting of their good works. Because they will scatter the Jewish back. They all had a Jewish background in the past. They were accustomed and used to follow them. So it kind of hard to have it break. Yeah, it's very 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 hard so that James challenges that person to show their faith without such empty works, and he would demonstrate his faith by his genuine and sanctified works. Now, works without faith are also dead. I mean, works do not save, right? Uh, works that are born without faith are spiritless. Uh, what do you call a body without a spirit? 
dead corpse. <laughs> so Jesus further taught uh, people about uh, with dead works and hypocrites in Matthew 21. He says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Right? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, uh, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? But what does he say to such people? He says, I never knew you. Get away from me. In fact, your works were works of lawlessness. Lawlessness. Your practices of lawlessness. So faith and works exist as an inseparable aspect of a genuine Christian life, right? Imagine a pair of scissors. Which blade is more important? Without one, without one, it's no longer good function, right? So, what is your faith and what is your work? It's all about money. So, truth, true faith involves a vital relationship with God that results in a new person, right? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5:17. Visit this one a couple times here. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all have become new. Right? So Paul writes in Ephesians uh, 2 8, for, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And so we're seeing here we've got these examples of where people are trying to boast on their works uh, for their salvation. Uh, now going on to verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. Good works. For good works. And which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in this. So if we trust in the Lord, he will direct our paths, right? Proverbs 3. Uh, he'll give us good works to do. So we don't necessarily have to go looking for good works to do. Uh, these are the sanctified works that we're called to do uh, for his glory. And look at this again. God prepared these beforehand for us to walk in. He knew since the beginning of creation everything that he would want us to do. And that's why he saved us from um, Ephesians 2 8. He saved us from good works. Good works. So going on back to James 2, uh, verse 19. Now he goes on, he talks, but you believe that God is one. Well, you do well. Um, the demons also believe and shudder. So he, and I learned something new here. He's quoting, well, he's quoting the great Shema from Deuteronomy 6, 4. Where he says, uh, oh, hear, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Go ahead. Just to uh, go, go, go back up to um, um, in one, in, in, in chapter one, when James, uh, you know, in chapter one, in verse one, when James says right here, that uh, let's see what I want to say. Uh, James said, I'm a bond servant. James didn't come saying, you know, like, I like this part where he said, I'm a bond servant. He didn't come saying, I'm Dr. James. I'm, you know, all these credentials. He came as a bond servant, which right. Paul said in Romans 1 1. But he also says right here, he said, serve, I'm sorry, uh, bond servant of God and Jesus Christ. I like that because he, like he's saying now in Matthew uh, 6, 24, it, don't get on time. Matthew 6, 24, it says you can't serve two masters. But James is pointing this out right here in verse 1 in here. He said, I serve God and the Lord. Just because the name's bringing out the Trinity right. of the whole three. That's right. See, the Trinity, mm -hmm. you know, you know, like I said, you can't serve two masters, but he doesn't mm -hmm. know, hey, it's one. Going back to what you were saying, right. first, first, not trying to right. Well, Jesus right. basically invited us to follow him, right? Mm -hmm. He said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments and keep my word. So we're, we are to follow him. He is our Lord and he is our Savior. And he's, 
Um, you know, in Matthew 28, he says that his last words, perhaps, to the apostles was, therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, right? Okay. So, so James says good if you believe in God, but your theology is not evidence for your faith. Even demons believe. One might call that demonic faith. Uh, in the Gospels and Acts, demons acknowledge the truth of Jesus and his works. Their belief in God caused demons to shudder, but uh, it was failed to save them. Right? So one pastor said that you know Jesus encountered legion, I heard this story, and then cast them out into pigs. He, he joked that he created the first double ham. <laughs> so, so it's not enough to intellectually believe. We must believe in our hearts. Now, Paul writes in Romans 10, uh, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And he explains in the next verse, verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness. Not the mind, for with the heart. And with the mouth, uh, confession is made unto salvation. So true faith is more than intellectual adherence. It's placing one's full trust in Jesus for our salvation. You know, I was just thinking, that, you know, the world on the whole doesn't understand why we, we would want to be bond servants and slaves. Mm -hmm. Because they have the rebellion, the rebelliousness, and they're like, why would you want to give your life over? Because there's so much joy, because there's so much peace, because you don't have the, the frustration. It's just amazing, and they don't get it. Oh, oh, yes. Along with what you said, what? Um, the difference between a bond servant and a regular servant was a bond servant wanted to be there. Mm -hmm. okay. So that's okay. why they were had an all go through their ear at the doorpost, yes. mm -hmm. you know, so they yeah. said, this is Mark saying, I want to be with my master, mm -hmm. you know, so do who, do who. Oh, that have, like, when a, the slave had the option of becoming free, free. free. Yes. and that if they choose to stay with their master, then they're bond servants? Yes. And they be there the doorpost for the whole year. Yes. I want to be. Right. And so, yes, there was a sabbatical, uh, <laughs> And so if you want to, like people say online during, you know, discussions, well, your God, your God condoned slavery. No, he ended slavery. They were Jews. He ended slavery. And then if you want to stay because maybe the person you're with had the money you didn't, and you didn't mind working for him, then he took it. She never well, how should our belief in God be different from the demons' belief? We have a choice, they don't. So we have to continue our faith. We have to continue our faith. It's too late for them to turn around. Well, that's good. But you know, um, the, and the demons believe in shudder. Well, we, we have a choice to accept it, right? And, and they, they won't. You know, yeah.
to the very last second they could accept him. Oh, well, they, they want money and glory and everything now. And, you know, I had one time where I was driving, along, I was like, Lord, please, can't I have another car? Can I have something that's decent to drive? And I heard in my spirit, do you want it now or do you want it later? It's like, oh, later, much better. You know, eternity, much better deal. Yeah. And they don't, I don't know if they're not getting it or they're just wanting it now or. I mean, because they have the right house, the money and the cars and <clears throat> everything now, but it's ultimately materialistic. You know, it's not going to get them into heaven. They're going to be with Satan. Unless and you never think you're going to get sick, and you never think you're going to get old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's why God did that. You know, sometimes you feel like God. Why wouldn't the author said, why why couldn't you be old and be young again? See, you know, there's sometimes we have to just surrender. Right. You right. know. <laughs> How should our fear of God be different from the demons' fear of God? You know, you have so many different statements. I should mention the Illuminati. You know, statements when they hear the gospel, someone who's trying to put a knowledge of the truth and repent after having served. And, you know, and they're, they're very glad to get out of deception. They're very glad to know a way different and hate and murder and, you know, so I just thank God that he, he asked the question, how can they hear without a preacher? And how can the preacher accept and repent that he have labors out where people that are deceived and not, you know, knowing the gospel or giving the gospel and then when they hear the gospel, they receive it and repent. All right, well, thank you for fear of God different. Well, the demons are going to get, they're going to the lake of fire. But our fear of the Lord is what? I once heard Andy Stanley say on this verse over here, it was very funny, and he was downtown and he, he preached this, but, um, you know, you do well, you know. The demons also believe. At least they're doing something, you good people. At least they're shuddering. Well, the the demons, you know, fear God. Uh, you know, more of the fear of their destruction. Where uh, our fear is more of an awe of, you know, how perfect God is. And mm -hmm. you know, That's a good it's more of like a reverence. Right. We reverence God and we respect Him, and the fear of the Lord is again in the wisdom. Mm -hmm. But also, there's a negative. And that's what a lot of people are using today to promote their agenda, fear, mm -hmm. but the negative fear. But with our positive fear, it, it's offset what they are doing because we reference God and we see exactly what's going on. So we can tell the difference and discern the difference between that evil mm -hmm. and good. And, um, you know, Andy also said, <coughs> That same, not that I'm remembering it. Um, you know, he's talking to the Jewish people who are saved, great, but they were not doing anything. So James comes in and says, do something. Mm -hmm. And so faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. And he says, that's like a dead dog in the streets. You know what a dead dog does best? Stinks. <laughs> you know, he says, so you're, you're, you're doing nothing. It stinks. Do something, you know. <laughs> Um, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be in the uh, true faith of works. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's, like I said, it's a test, really. That's what he really, James is really showing. Testing about, you know, your faith in, in who you believe in. And because these people are Jews coming back uh, from the north, north and South, East, and like they have been scattered. So it's testing, it's a test that James is talking about all through our belief and our saving faith and our living faith, how we live today. And it's very important that he wants to um, uh, make sure they got evidence of that living faith, uh, even dead faith. Yeah. So going on to verse 20, uh, James writes, 
But you who are willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, uh, I'm sorry, let me read that again. But are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? James is calling faith without works useless. Well, isn't it? Didn't God see, uh, didn't we see that God has works for us to do? God needs us to, needs to make use of us. Uh, if we don't do the works, we're not being utilized, right? If we don't recognize this, we are being poor. So Jesus tells us in John uh, chapter 15, yes. 4 through 8, uh, he says, If abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you useless, uh, can you use, unless, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Did Jesus say, I can do the will of the Father without him, I can't do anything. So without him, we can't do anything. If anyone makes, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as the branch dries up, and they gather them and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Right? Uh, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask yourself, uh, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And here's the key: saying, "My Father is glorified by this." that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. So here again, Jesus is giving us saying how we can be recognized by the world as his disciples, as we're bearing fruit. Um, so going on verse uh, 21, in Second James. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works. Key part there. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected. He didn't say he didn't have faith. His faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. So Abraham's faith saved him. But his faith was not without resulting works that demonstrated it. Abraham's faith was active together with his works. His obedience demonstrated the integrity of his faith. James argued that, that it was by works that Abraham's faith was perfected. Yeah. Paul does to prove faith right. by this promise that God gave without him having to do anything. Right. But then after that's done, then you're going to have to follow through. And then as Mike was saying over here about tribulation in, in the first chapter of James, we have to experience tribulation to prove yourself. Uh, and, and works will prove yourself, but tribulation brings about things. Mm -hmm. Are you going to wither from that vine you were talking about here, or will you stay drafted, grafted on that vine? Mm -hmm. And through tribulation, that proves it. And here Abraham, in his second phase, has been given a tribulation. And that is his son. So, going on to verse 24, um, James writes, You see that a man is justified by works, and not by faith alone. Hmm. What did he say? <laughs> justified by works? Yeah. You know, remember, the Apostle Paul was refuting those who taught that works were a means of, to justification in Galatians. James is countering those who think that works are optional for believers. And James is not trying to say here that we need works to be saved, rather that our justification produces works. Well, wouldn't it? That's very important. Yeah. 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 We do good works because we're saved. That's right. right. He's saying that you could tell that a person is genuine mm -hmm. 
you know, because the work that they do, the good deeds, like Mother Teresa, mm -hmm. you know, she did a lot of good deeds, but her faith was in, you know, it had nothing to do with her salvation, but the deeds that she's done, and even Billy Graham, all the deeds, not just the preaching, but he also did done a lot of good deeds, and that kind of tells us it was genuine. And it's almost um, like Mike mm -hmm. said in Revelation, Revelation three, and when Jesus, you know, that was in Sodom, and then he was talking about seven spirits, seven churches, but he was talking about those different churches because we have churches on every corner, and uh, here in Atlanta, number four, five of them. anyway, there's some of the churches could not wait the true fact. Some of the churches are, you know, J.W., Charles Russell, Joseph Smith, uh, Buddha, and different things. But it's saying the truth, and it, it, it done, it wrote this in the Philadelphia church. And it, it, it really didn't see no error in the Philadelphia church because they had, they never uh, denied his word, but they kept his name. They never did, did, did denied his name. And Pastor James has given a little bit about this, saying, how, uh, you know, as true faith, we're not going straight from, from the word of God. We're not going to be ashamed of his name. We're not going to deny his word any kind of way. We're going to sign his word as genuine faith. You know, we really, you know, as his test, we're going to pass his test of uh, what he's, you know, allowed happen to us because we are in the test every day. And isn't it as we grow and we really, you know, stay in him and his word and, and that we allow his heart to become our heart. So we turn from being so focused on ourselves, really, to really caring about others. Yeah. What was that last sentence that you said for this? So we could all take it down. And if anybody came up to us and, like uh, that person said, see, right. you see that a man is justified by works, you know, uh, and not just by faith alone. So what was that sentence? Uh, and James is not trying to say here that we need works to be saved. Rather, our justification produces works. Doesn't that go back to James 1.22? You know, the chapter before where he says, but be rules of the word and not be the only right. deceiving yourself. Mm -hmm. Because if anyone is, is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like someone looking at his own face and under That's right. And, and forgetting it. saved by works, we're saved by faith, and our living faith produces works. Yes. And it's not that works are not optional for a believer. Rather, our works are a result of our faith. And they are not, our, they're our faith in action, right? It's not that we have to do them. We want to do them. We're motivated by love and by the Holy Spirit within us. Our prompter. So going uh, on in verse um, 25. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot, Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out um, another way? So James is pulling another person from the scriptures as an example. First it was the man Abraham, right? The, who was the revered father of Israel. Uh, then in stark contrast, he chose Rahab, who was a prostitute, a sinner, right? And a Gentile. During the time of conquest of the promised land, Rahab helped Joshua's men in Jericho to escape the king. Uh, her faith in God prompted her works to help. 
uh, for uh, for this her whole family was spared during the siege of the city so both of them demonstrated faith their faith by their works I, I like this example of the way that um, because sometimes when we think of I think of about work is like you work hard like work but actually she is she made a decision this is not like she labor is like she made a decision to save that people that kind of work is like you know you make a decision to follow God to do the right thing to choose to choose to choose follow God's direction it's not like you have to labor or you know farm I mean well she took the a risk work. too yeah. Yeah. she risked yeah. her own death yes by helping these spies out the king yeah. could have put her to death that moment right Right. So it was her faith that it was going to work out. So, so why is it important to see faith that works, uh, faith and works as partners instead of competitors? Why is it important to see faith and works as partners rather than competitors? I think one example is like Sunday we come to church. By coming to church is work. So. You don't need to tell people that you're a Christian all, a lot of time. When you, by coming to church, people know that you're a Christian. Indirectly, you share the gospel. That's how oh, I encourage my mother to go to church. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I agree. Without, without works, you know, if we you know, have a great faith, and you treat yourself as, say, a monk in a monastery, you're not, tr you're not sharing that. You know, in fact, you know, if you're not really giving that message to others. That's what's important through the works. Part at least it gives a message. It makes other people see something and say, you know, that person, you know, seems to have something there. But if we don't have any works whatsoever, we're just keeping it like a monk in a monastery, keeping it within, not going out. And that's why I think it should work together, not to be a stumbling block to those. Mm -hmm. Again, yeah. those monks, monks aren't necessarily doing anything useful for the Lord. Right. Um, <laughs> sequestered in, in isolation. Right? Like so often on the RDG, you know, they're always like, well, those Christians, they killed people back in the, you know, and I'm like, what were their works? Were they really Christians? Right. They may have said they were Christians, but Jesus said, you shall know them by their fruits. Right. If they weren't showing fruits, they weren't Christians. That's right. <laughs> just because they say you are doesn't mean you are. Well, I, I just heard there are some Christian witches, which it's an oxymoron, and just because someone says they're Christian. Wait, they wait which witch are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> There's some congregation calls themselves Christian witches, and yes. it says we have to test every spirit. We do have to test every spirit. By the spirit. And could you say this, you know, in, in regards to works, <coughs> only Christians get baptized. We're not getting baptized to be a Christian. But only Christians get baptized, yeah. and they show it that they're Christian by getting baptized. Only Christians take communion, and they're showing that work because they're Christians, you know. And only Christians do good works, yes. good spiritual works, not like the works that um, you were talking about or you were talking about, but that type of thing. So yeah, the good works. To glorify our Father. Yes. That's the word because yeah. that's what we say for by grace, as back in two, uh, uh, Ephesians 2 8, yeah. say by grace, and then we oh. just work this year as, you know, in Christ as Jesus. In Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And they say, uh, created in the image of God. Created and then doing the good works. That's what's going to glorify God. And this is going to look at, you know, what Ray, you know, going back to Ray asked, that she risked her life, but it was justified uh, with that uh, taking that risk. That what she did to hide those men, and uh, it was justified before God. It was justified before God. Mike, Mike says that um, she believed that God had given Canaan to the Israelites and acted on that on that faith. So her lie was good. Yeah, really. Sometimes you have to in that case. But saying only Christians are baptized and take a communion and you know, my brothers and sisters belong to something out west that's not Christian and they do all that stuff. So I don't want people to think that they're Christians. Just because 
because they do that stuff. Yeah, because they don't believe <coughs> But it, all of these are hypotheticals that we're talking about anyway. <coughs> the truth is God knows our hearts. And did you say, Paul, that some just, if you get baptized, they're just wet sinners. Some do. Really yes, just, some of them are. I'm up just a wet like, like wet incense or something <laughs> yeah. like that. You know, they have to know, they have to, by faith, this is my death, burial, resurrection in the Lord Jesus Christ. You some know, do so it as a ritual. Not as a ritual, but as a Maybe. proclamation of your faith. Meaning that we're actually lying about them, causing harm against them, trying to do something. So he was very specific about what kind of lying we're not to do. Something that results in harmful harm in our brothers and sisters um, and ourselves. I suppose. So yeah, using a deception as part of uh, in war, you know, it's something that they say all fair, all fair and love. <laughs> right. James, you know, sort of bring the test about, you know, if you've been redeemed, washed in the blood, then you should have that redeeming conduct, attitude, and be able to demonstrate the love of Christ in you because you have a new identity in line up with his purpose. There's, there's a song that I learned years ago, and they'll know that we are Christians by my love. By my love. All right, so verse 26, uh, for just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also is faith without works is dead. So James is concluding his argument here, comparing the body-spirit relationship to that of works and faith. The body without a spirit, you know, is a corpse, right? The person who claims to have faith and has no works is a spiritual corpse, and there's no life in it. And when we say life, we're talking about Jesus, right? He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? So, um, so here's a question. If, if God saved you, he extended his grace to you, he put his Holy Spirit in you, did it change you? Has it changed you? Has to. Has to. Are you more gracious? It has to change you. Well, it's simple. <laughs> Are you learning to love? Yeah, and to serve. Are you beginning to hold dear the things of the Lord uh, way more than you used to? Mm. Wanting to be in the Word, wanting to uh, be uh, doers of the Word, doing, um, keeping Jesus' commands in His Word. So are you beginning to see your life as a ministry all the time, no matter where you are or what you're doing? Like it works. It's the work. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you step outside that and you do something no. that this. doesn't show that inside you is a person, you know, that God will convict you so bad. It's not your I'm still suffering over it. So, I'm really at that conviction. But the words, they're going to be coming to you. God is going to have a testimony for them. They were so much as possible. They don't believe. I mean, Wednesday, but the rest of the day is it like the world? Judgment. Hey, don't do that. Let your light shine all through the week. That's the thing about life. You imagine the, the roof is not bright because the roof is bright. It's bright because of the light that's reflected off of it. Right. Yeah. Also, and as, that light is correct. As believers, we can get disciplined by God. Uh -huh. as well, 
you know, and, and it says in the Old Testament, um, uh, my son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor faint when you are reproved by him. For those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines, and he scourges every son whom he receives. Like, I love my sons to death. It, it doesn't mean that they can get away with things, but I'm doing it in love. You know? Was it kind of like the fear of the Lord? Yes. Discipline. Or just taking away the self hope. You know? yeah. No, that's an example. I mean, I'm looking at the fear of the Lord. Well, you know, God loves us, but if he's our Heavenly Father, we're to kind of think about him as a father figure, right? Exactly. Well, Father loves us. What does he do when we're bad? Dave, you're kind of saying that we learn our respect through that when he's situation. Well, there's a, there, there's a fear, there's a respect, there's a knowing that there's consequences to actions that are outside of the will of our Father. Right. And some, some people get angry when God discipline. They don't really feel like, you know, repenting of it. And so I'm staying angry for a long time. But I think the book of James says some also got premature death because they refuses to change, but they still be saved, mm -hmm. like escaping through the fire. Mm -hmm. So, well, in yeah. First, first or second John, he talks about the sin that leads to death, right? Right. right. So God has done a work for us, all of us, right? And it's these works that are produced by God's work in us, right? So let's see. In summary, James is sure that saving faith transforms the believer so that good works will follow. And he complains about people who say they have faith, but whose lives show quite plainly that they have not been saved. And when people have saving faith, God transforms their lives. James points out that in the absence of this transformation, we have no real reason for thinking that those who profess to be believers really have saving faith. So now the Apostle Paul instructs us in 2 Corinthians 13. Yes. He says, examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Uh, do you not know that yourselves that Christ Jesus is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified. He threw that in there. It's, it's kind of like a, a stop gap. Yeah. Second Corinthians 13. It's in the five. So I want to go back to this. Second Corinthians 5, 17 through 20. Okay. So therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he has given us a spirit of reconciliation. That is, that God was created, uh, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So, and, uh, and Paul also talks about us being on a mission of restoration, uh, that we're to restore everyone, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ from the gentle spirit, that they're not to be condemning, we're to be loving story, and not just of brothers and sisters in Christ, but of uh, people that haven't come to know the gospel and haven't come to know Christ, or to reach out to them in love. And, you know, the lady's testimony today about the choir, it, in her statement of how when she came back, <coughs> and she instead of found con condemning or condemnation or what are you doing here, she instead found welcoming love, and you know, that was the worldly anticipation that she had was uh, rejection. Maybe the, the caricature of, of Christians that some people have is that we're condemning the Christians. But instead, you know, like you said, Jesus said, a new command I give you, to love one another. As, as I have loved you, he loved us sacrificially and loved us as a servant, right? Self, uh, um, 
giving up of self. So no greater love is one that sacrifices their it's life to their friends or their, their self. Um, teaching us to be selfless servants of one another and loving one another. And he said, by this the world will know you as my disciples. That if you have this love for one another, and it's not just us, it's love for the world, our neighbors, our enemies, everyone. And Dr. Stanley, we are teaching on that last night on kindness. <coughs> kindness and gentleness mm -hmm. draw people to you. And Jesus said, the loving and kindness have I drawn you. So let that gentleness here and cause someone to just be curious. You know, she's not harsh like me. And, and I, I'm trying my best to learn that. Because I find myself wanting myself. I want to, someone to be kind to me and love to me. And yeah, I, I, I seem to be drawn to people like that. We all need, I mean, we should be responding. Every time we face a situation, no matter how big or small, where we have an opportunity to decide how we're going to respond to that situation. Are we going to respond to it with love and compassion and understanding? And, uh, or are we going to respond to it uh, selfishly? So, you know, speaking about being reconciled to God, you know, so if you've not been reconciled to God, there's no time like now, right? Amen. Remember, putting your trust in Jesus is a life-changing event. You become a new creature. We're remade as a new creation in Christ with a new heart, with new desires. And um, you're given God's Holy Spirit that Jesus sent to be with us and in us, in you and with you. And most of all, you're given eternal life in heaven with the Father and the Son. And the best thing is what? It's free, right? There's nothing we have to do, nothing we have to pay. No ceremony, ceremony we have to perform. You know? No operation we have to have. <laughs> uh, all we have to do is pray uh, for, for to accomplish. Uh, just all you have to do is just believe in Him, right? I think Paul has more commands. If you went and listed them all out, between Paul, James, and Peter, they have more commands in number than there are in the, in the Old Testament. Wow. I, don't, I can't quote you exactly. It's more like a thousand or something. But I <laughs> no, but that's not. You're right. They are more because uh, even when Paul put a man to Peter, they put them out. say that every one of them is an application of Jesus' one command to love. The bottom denominator is that we should be loving, loving representatives, ambassadors for Christ. Yeah. And like I said, that's what, uh, you know, when he, he said, you know, you love me, you keep my commandment, but he also put in Romans, uh, uh, Romans uh, 8.28, 
for the love of Christ, you know, all things work together. And we know that God causes all things to work for good. Yes. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. So, um, so yeah, in summary, our works, our faith, doesn't require works. It produces works. If we really have a saving faith, we will have works. We don't necessarily have to worry about finding works to do. Just put your trust in Jesus and the Lord, and rest assured, he will have something for you to do. And just listen for his guiding word. And it's in Isaiah. Just listen to the voice from behind. It will say, walk to the left and walk to the right. Stim this anyway. more voice. Listen to the voice of the Spirit. Stim this more as voice. Say in Revelation 3 7. Mm -hmm. That's a loud voice. Thank you. All right, well, <laughs> let's go to the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> Heavenly Father, our Holy Father, uh, we want to thank you for your grace that we can be justified simply by our saving faith in you and your finishing work son on the cross. We thank you for transform, uh, your transforming work that you do in us and through us. We thank you for the works that you give us so that we may glorify you. Because Lord, that's what it's all about. Everything is for your glory. Lord, we ask that you will help us always to show uh, and show us how to put our faith into action. To reveal in us anywhere we may be lacking. And help us always to be good ambassadors for you in our daily lives, no matter where we are or what we're doing. And uh, we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you. And thank you for coming. Yes.